Hey everyone, welcome to worship here with Ferndale Free Methodist Church. My name is Scott Gentry. I'm the senior pastor. It's my privilege to, to welcome each of you here, whether you are a part of our FFMC family here in the Ferndale, Michigan area, or if you're someone that joins us regularly from uh, other places around the state of Michigan or other cities around the U.S., we are so glad that this has become uh, a regular place for you to to meet, to feel connected with others in uh, in the body of Christ, uh, to be fed. Hopefully, uh, that you you sense that you're drawing some uh, good truth as we teach the Bible here week after week to give you an avenue to be able to praise God and just to be able to find strength and hope and encouragement. So, so glad that each of you are here. And a special greeting again, if you're a first time guest with us today, however you found yourself here, uh, we hope that you'll find strength, hope, help and encouragement uh, just from uh, your time with us. So, so grateful that you're with us today. You know, one of the questions that's worth asking, even when we meet online for worship, uh, is just this. Why is it that we, we gather together anyway? Why even sit down, you know, in front of your TV or your computer, your phone uh, like this? Or when we have the opportunity to, to meet in person, uh, either inside our building or like outdoor worship like we've been doing? Well, it really has to do with the nature of the church as, as God has created us. He's made us as the body of Christ, each having an important part to play in the body of Christ. But really, God says, I pull you together as a, a gathering of people. The, the New Testament, kind of the Greek word for that, the ekklesia, you know, is a gathering. And it really is a gathering of those that God has called, drawn, drawn to himself. But he draw, draws us together so that we can be strengthened, encouraged, and equipped. And then we become the scattered people, that we live out our faith in our homes, in our neighborhoods, you know, wherever God has placed us. So he says, I, I want you to come together to, to give your praise to me, to find strength, encouragement, and help. And then I want you to live out the presence of Jesus wherever I have placed you. And that's what we ho hope will happen today just by our being together for this time of worship. So we're going to continue to worship right now with a song that we like, like to sing here that's just called uh, Worthy of All My Praise. And uh, we hope that that's what you'll do right now. Join in this singing with it and from your heart say, Lord, I will give you all my worship. You're worthy of all my praise. Let's do that right now.
Good morning. My name is Sherry, and I'm part of our guest services team here at Ferndale Free Methodist Church. Whether you're joining us from near or far, it's an honor to have you worship with us today. If you're joining us for the very first time online, I would just like to extend a nice warm welcome to you. We love our guests, and we're so grateful that you're here to worship with us. Here at Ferndale Free Methodist Church, we exist to connect, to grow, and serve. And so that we can better serve you, fill out our digital connection card. You can include such things as prayer requests so that we can be praying for you. Church family, once again, I just want to say thank you to all of you who've helped keep our food pantry stocked. It's been such a blessing to many in our community and to our church. I had a conversation with Kay the other day, and she said, it's like the fish and the loaves. She said, we have more cereal in our food pantry than Costco has on its shelves. So thank you so much. In July, we did breakfast food donations. So for the month of August, we are going to be asking for donations of pasta sauce and pasta. And if you'd like to donate some of these items, there's several ways that you can do that. Number one. You can just simply bring your donations with you when you come to worship. We have a table set up in our fellowship hall that you can deposit the donations right there. Number two, you can make a monetary donation. You can include it with your offering and just designate it to our food pantry. And uh, we have a couple ways of doing a non-contact um, deposit. Um, first of all, we can do a porch pickup simply call our wonderful church secretary, Kay, and arrange a porch pickup. Someone will come to your porch, pick it up, and deliver it back to our food pantry. And lastly, we have a non-contact drop-off box. That box is right outside the doors of our fellowship hall, right to the right of our entrance of our church. So thank you all so much. Thank you for being a blessing to others, and you have a beautiful and blessed day. Hi all, my name is Laura and I'm the children's pastor here at Ferndale Free Methodist Church and I have a rock painted like a ladybug. Miss Dana painted this for those of you guys who know Dana Zolke and a cotton ball. And now most of us have probably in our lives at some point touched both a cotton ball and a rock at some point or another. So question for you, which one is soft and which one is hard? Which one, if I were to throw it at you would hurt if it hit you. The cotton ball or the rock? The rock. The rock would hurt you. Have you ever thought about how our words can be like cotton balls or like rocks? It can be kind words that build one another up. Like, you look really nice today or thank you or can I please have dot dot dot. Or they can be mean words like you're a meanie head or things that just discourage or tear one another down. Kind words or mean words. Proverbs 16, 24 tells us that kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul and healthy for the body. Our words have a power to affect people. They can be kind words, they can be soft words, or they can be mean words, they can be hard words. So I encourage you this week to use your kind words. Look for times, especially when you want to use your unkind words, to use kind words, to speak kindly to other people, to speak softly, to speak lovingly, and to, to pour into them kind words that are sweet to their soul. Well, for here at FFMC, for Endow Free Methodist Church, uh, we begin a new chapter in our ministry. Uh, our associate pastor, Michael Heckert, has served the church faithfully for over four years. But now God is leading him in a new direction of ministry uh, as he trains to be a hospital chaplain, which Michael will do an excellent job with that. So we're so grateful for Michael's service with us for these last four years. But today begins the, uh, the new chapter of our new youth pastor, Bryce Carfa. Bryce is someone that uh, grew up in our church. Uh, felt his call to ministry You're here. He'll tell you about that. Uh, studied to be a youth pastor. And we're so excited that Bryce is with us. So Bryce has prepared a little introductory video to introduce himself to you. So here's Bryce Carafa. Hello, my name is Bryce Carafa, and I'm the new youth pastor here at Ferndale Free Methodist Church. Now, some of you will recognize that name because some of you will recognize me. I grew up at Ferndale Free Methodist Church. I was heavily involved in the children's program from things like CLC and Upwards Basketball and Christmas musicals 
to again in the youth group with with garage sales and spaghetti dinners and missions trips and activities I I was heavily involved and I loved it unfortunately I had to move away before I graduated high school um, I had to go with my family because my dad got a job in Maryland and I went there and spent my last year of high school my senior year going to high school in Maryland now, I was only there for a year but it really taught me a lot about who God is and that God is a God everywhere you know he's he's the only one and he he'll go with you from Michigan to Maryland now after that one year of high school in Maryland I came back to Michigan and studied youth ministry at Spring Arbor University for four years um, those are some of the best four years of my life and they were really fulfilling and impactful I met a lot of great friends and great professors who really both both groups of people poured into me and taught me a lot of different things about who God is and it was just a wonderful experience that has made me who I am today after after my four years of, of college I took a position in Maryland and have been serving there uh, up until now and I'm really grateful to have that start in ministry but I feel like God has called me out of Maryland and called me into Ferndale. And so I'm super excited to see what God does, uh, not only in the youth group, but also in the whole church body. I'm super excited to see where that goes. So thank you guys. I am really excited to meet every one of you.
stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop. Well, last week we began a new sermon series, a new study, uh, looking at the New Testament letter or book of First Thessalonians. This was written by the Apostle Paul when the church was just expanding, and Paul had been doing some missionary work around Europe, and he went to the uh, city of Thessalonica. It's in northern Greece. It still exists today. And he began to, to share the gospel of Jesus with people that were there, to Jews that were located there, as well as people that were from a Greek culture, a very secular culture. And people began to respond to the gospel. And then what happened was he was only there for about a month. And then really persecution began to, to break out. There were people that were opposing Paul. Uh, he had two partners with him, Silas and Timothy. And after only a month, they were driven out of town. And this letter was written about a year and a half later. They didn't have the communication technology that we have. And so Paul had sent his partner in ministry, Timothy, back to Thessalonica. He just wanted to see, did the church even survive? We don't even know how it's doing. Timothy came back to Paul with a phenomenal report. He said, Paul, not only did the church uh, survive, it's thriving. And then so Paul writes this letter to them to instruct them and to keep encouraging them in the faith. So today we're picking it up in chapter 2, and we're going to look at the first 12 verses of chapter 2. And in this we see a real theme that Paul writes to them and, and kind of helps them to remember his ministry uh, while he was with them, along with uh, Silas and Timothy. And really the theme is, as you remember how we did ministry, well, do the same things. Be an imitator of us because we're imitating Jesus. So let's look now at these first 12 verses, and then I'll just kind of walk through the letter and some of the the things that we can draw from it for personal application to us. Here's the word of the Lord from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We'd previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dared to tell his gospel in the face of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We're not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. You know we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. Instead, we were like young children among you. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are our witnesses, and so is God of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. 
Now, some people, when they hear this, it sounds like that Paul was really just trying to, you know, defend himself. Maybe that there were people that were attacking him and Silas and Timothy, and he feels like that he needs to defend their reputation. And that could be true. But there's another way to look at this too. Paul's writing this about a year and a half later, and he's having them call to mind. He says, you remember how we were among you. And it really goes back a little bit to the the first chapter uh, of 1 Thessalonians, where he said, as they did ministry with them, that he said, you imitated us, and therefore you were imitating God. And so one of the ways that we can look at this is Paul saying, as you remember how we did ministry, as we modeled ministry to you, then do the same things. And that's a theme that's picked up in other places in Scripture. In the New Testament letter, 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote, said, follow our example because we follow Jesus. And it's one of the things for those people who are disciple makers, those people who invest in the lives of other people, Sunday school teachers, children's workers, uh, youth workers, for people who are teaching others about Jesus. Part of what we do is we, we pass on the truths of the gospel. There's the information part, but so much of disciple making as, as is as people observe how we live our life. Are, are we really living out the faith that we talk about? And Paul in this section says, I'm going to remind you again how we lived. And he gives that then as a model for them to follow as well. Now in this, Paul really kind of speaks uh, about some, maybe four kind of specific areas that he said, here's some things you might remember among us. Uh, he says this, he says, you remember our boldness, and, and he wanted them to remember how God helped them. He said in the verses one through two, we had the privilege and we suffered, uh, even though we were treated like you know, outrageously in, in Philippi, and he said this, we, we dared to tell you the gospel in the face of strong opposition. One of the things I love about this section, even as Paul first began it, he said, you know, we were, we were only there for about a month, and some people could have said it was a failure, and he says, but you know our ministry wasn't a failure. Let me speak this directly to those of you, whether you're a part of our, our congregation here at Ferndale or other churches. God will use anything that you do to bring glory to him, no matter if in our eyes or even in the world's eyes, if it seems like it's a failure, sometimes we try things and it doesn't look like that it even works. And we may say, oh, well, we tried it, you know, okay, but nothing's really gonna come from that. Paul could look back to the church in Thessalonica and say, we were only with you a month. We worked with you. We taught you the truth about the gospel. We taught you truths about Jesus, about how to live life as believers and then left. And then here they're gone a year and a half. And that seed took root and it began to grow and it was bearing fruit. So I just wanna encourage each of us, try things, be courageous, be bold, especially in this time of COVID, we're trying to learn how to do church in, in an entirely new way. And when we try something and it maybe doesn't work the way we thought it did, maybe the numbers aren't there, be encouraged because God can say, can say even with something that looks like it didn't you know, produce the fruit, the outcome we thought it was going to produce, God can say, I'm gonna use something great through that. But one of the things, again, he says, as you, you looked at our lives, you saw we were bold, even in the face of, of opposition. The other thing he could say is this wholeheartedness we have uh, as we preach the gospel. And the reason was because he says, we were approved by God. This was our mission. God has entrusted us to teach the gospel. We picked that up in verses three and four. He says, uh, for the appeal we make doesn't spring from error or impure mo impure motives. We're not trying to trick you. He says, on the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. So those of you, again, who are ministry leaders, those of you who are working and investing in the lives of people, God says, you have been entrusted with the most important, you know, most uh, treasured thing on earth, the truth of the gospel. And so he, he sees you as an approved worker. He says, I'm, I'm putting my seal of approval on you. So do the work and do that wholeheartedly. Another thing that he reminds them of, he says, as we worked among you in ministry, you saw our gentleness, and he begins to use these family relationships. It's interesting because Paul says, we were like children among you, and then he says, but then we care for you like a nursing mother, and then we also you know, encourage you like a father. And so through this, this section in, in 1 Thessalonians 2, with these different things of family imagery, he says, we were gentle. We didn't come in being harsh and overbearing. We were so tender and caring like a mommy, and then we were encouraging and helping you to take steps of faith like a dad. And then the other area, he says, is you saw that we were blameless. We were worthy of God. And he goes out of his way uh, to speak about this in two areas. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. So this whole idea of being an imitator, 
is really important. So let's pause just for a moment before I go any further with the teaching on this. If you call yourself a, a follower of Jesus, if you're, if you're a Christian, uh, how do people view you? How do people, if they look at you, could they say, I see in you a pattern of life that says, I see Jesus. I, I, I see in, in you someone that's taking the truths of the gospel and the gospel is transforming you. It's changing you and you have become a new person. Do people, when they look at you, see a, a person that could say, I could pattern my life after them. And the heart of it is because you're patterning your life after Jesus. And then we, we get instruction from people like Paul and other people who've invested in, in our lives. I can think in my own life, people who invested in me to teach me what it was to understand the Bible, to teach me to understand what it meant to live as a follower of Jesus. And I listened to their words, but I watched their life. And that's exactly what God wants to have happen for each of us who are followers of Jesus. Even in this time of being of COVID-19, I woke up this morning, I told my wife Leanna, as soon as I woke up this morning, the very first thought I had, as soon as my eyes opened was this, how do we do, how do we make disciples in this COVID era? Especially when we're not gathering the way that we used to and we're using, you know, these, these gifts and abilities that God's given us through like online platforms. And that's something all of us have to, to ask ourselves. How do we make disciples? How do we invest in the lives of people when we're not gathering the way that we used to gather? And the truth is, just like the song that we sang, Waymaker, God will instruct us and guide us and say, here's how the church will expand even in times like this. So all of us have to seek God and say, God, I want to be a disciple maker. I want to invest in the lives of people. I'm going to seek you for help with that. So in these four areas that, that Paul speaks about of being imitators, that's what we want to do. We'll kind of break those down a little bit as we go along here. So when you think about as you imitate someone, we do that in, in every area of life. I mean, cooking. How many of you either have someone that will say, I'm going to teach you something, or you just pull up something on YouTube and you are instructed by someone and you learn not only recipes, you learn techniques. It can be in arts, it can be in sports, it can be in business. There are just so many areas of life when we can say, we look to someone who knew something, had a skill, a set of knowledge, something that I learned from them and I began to imitate them. I began to study their techniques and study how they did things so that I could my, in my own life in that area improve. That's all discipleship is too. Only God says, not only, it goes both directions. We look at people to say, who is someone that I can look at that can help me to grow my faith? And then God says, then I want you to be that person to instruct other people. When Paul was beginning training for the, the one of the people that's with him in ministry, Timothy here, he wrote to Timothy early on in ministry. He says, Timothy, the things I've entrusted to you I want you to entrust to others also, who will then entrust to others also. So that's what discipleship is, passing on not just knowledge, but also as we look at people's lives and we begin to see how this all makes sense, how we live a life as a follower of Jesus. So as Paul was writing to this letter to the, the church uh, in Thessalonica, he realized this. Many of them, some of them have came out of a Jewish faith, but many came out of a very secular background. Uh, from a, a Greek background, and some of them had worshipped lots of other deities. There were lots of things, a very secularized life. And Paul realized that as they accepted the gospel and as he was teaching and disciple them, that he was calling them and challenging them to live a completely different way. And he had to help them to understand what that looked like, what he was asking them to do. And so in this, this little section of these first 12 verses of First Thessalonians, um, we see four particular behaviors that Paul was saying, this is what I want you to pay attention to, and I want you to pattern your life after this and to follow me. He, he wants him to, to learn to imitate how he had his own sense of priorities, and I'll explain each of these just briefly in, in a moment. A, a clear concern for the integrity of the gospel and the gospel message. He wanted them to have a clear sense of love and commitment to the people that they were ministering with and ministering to. And he wanted them to have a, cl a clear sense of the goal of uh, why he was doing the work and really for all of us, why is it that we carry out the work of the gospel? Why is it that we carry out the work of the church? So let's look at each of these. The first one, Paul really modeled a clear sense of 
of his priorities. All through this, he says, you, you saw how we worked, but here is the reason why we did uh, the work. When Paul uh, began his ministry in Thessalonica, he says early on, he says, we, we met strong opposition, people who were in that city who did not want him to teach the gospel message. Some of those were Jewish people that were, that were viewing uh, Christianity as a perversion of Judaism. And so Paul had to teach there, even with opposition there. And then there were other people that uh, were against Paul because he's saying, look, we have a Jesus who is our king. And they were saying, wait a minute, we only have one king. You know, King Caesar is our king. So Paul had to say, you have to understand this sense of priorities that we had that said, we, we are commissioned by God and that God has said, I have given you and trust you with the gospel to teach the gospel no matter what the opposition. So let me share this again with those of you who are part of our, our FFMC family, those of you who are involved in leadership. God says, make the gospel the priority. We've, we've said here this saying before, and it's, it's always worth bringing up. Remember to keep the main thing. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. So the main thing is the gospel of Jesus and letting people know that God offers life and salvation and hope and freedom. So the main thing is to keep the main thing, the gospel, the main thing about what we do. That's why we have, as our mission statement here, we say we exist to connect, to grow, and to serve, to have people to be connected with Christ, to grow in their faith, and to serve others. That's another way of saying keep the main thing, the main thing, the main thing. So Paul, first of all, models to the church at Thessalonica and to all of us as believers, Keep the gospel your priority. Don't get sidetracked by other things. Now, make certain that you realize God placed you on this planet for a purpose. The purpose was for you to know him and then for you to teach other people about the faith, to teach them and to model that faith. That is the main thing that is the priority. And so Paul had, had made that his priority among the, the church there in Thessalonica. The second thing was, he said, I modeled you a clear sense of, of concern for the integrity of the gospel. This is so important for today. In Paul's day, there, I mean, there were traveling preachers around in, in his day and, and who would come in, into town and, and try to draw a crowd and to teach things and they would do it either so that they would receive praise or they would make some money. I mean, sadly, it's the same thing is true in our day to do. You know, I, we, imagine how Paul would respond to, to many churches and to many ministers with the lavish lifestyles that they live. I mean, Paul, who said, we work so hard among you, so we wouldn't even be a burden to you because we wanted to make certain you knew we were teaching the gospel. It was about the gospel, not about us. Imagine how Paul would respond to some you know, pastor making an appeal that says, I just need another $24 million to buy a new jet. I mean, those kind of things, or I live in some luxurious mansion, so send in your money so I can still live in a multi, multi-million dollar home. So Paul was modeling something for them to, at that time, and it's modeling for us today that says the integrity of the gospel. This is about the gospel of Jesus transforming people. It's not about the praise that we get from people. For, you know, for those of us who are, are pastors, for those of us who, who lead ministries, we don't do things so people will say that was such a great job. It's okay to get you know, some, some uh, affirmation, but we don't make that our motive. And we certainly don't make it our motive so that we can prosper for it in any ways. And, and Paul, um, he had to deal with that in his day. And, he, and that's why he spoke so much about saying, you know how when we came, we didn't want to be a burden. We, we, we were working hard among you because we wanted this all to be about the gospel. Uh, when he presented the, the gospel, he made certain that they knew we weren't distorting the gospel. He said, God entrusted us with this truth about Jesus and his resurrection. That's what we're teaching. That's what we do here at, at Ferndale Free Methodist Church. We, we want to make certain everything that we teach in every area of our ministry, it is all scripturally based. You can go right to the scriptures and, and test it against what we're saying against what's there in the Bible. And you're not going to be saying, I don't know, it sounds like they took that and twisted it for their own purposes. We want to teach with integrity the truth of the whole Bible, the truth of the gospel. The other area that Paul was so careful with, with the integrity of the gospel here, was finances. And he really goes out of his way for this. He, he speaks about this in two different areas. You know, one, he said, we weren't coming and, and prospering from the people that we were evangelizing. So he said, you know, we didn't come in and share the gospel with you 
and you responded to it, you know, positively, and then somehow we said, so hey, you know, give a little bit of money back here. Now, Scripture talks about that, you know, ministers, you know, those who do the work of the gospel, uh, you know, that, that they're worthy to be, you know, to be compensated. I mean, that's okay. But he, he wanted, to, he went out of his way to say, you know, we weren't coming in and saying the reason that we shared this was to get, you know, uh, financial gain from you. And again, that, that's so prevalent in, in our culture today. So that's one thing. But then there's another part of this, and this is really important for every one of us, whether even if you're not a, a Sunday school teacher or a ministry leader, I mean, if you're just a Christian, and, it's just, and it still has to do with money, he says, watch how you handle money, especially other people's money. Paul went out of his way and said, look, remember that special offering we took to help this other church? You know, I didn't collect that. I wasn't the one holding on to that. I wasn't the one taking it and delivering that. There were people right from your own, you know, from Thessalonica, those who there were people who took up the offering who went and did that. And he did that for accountability. We have in our church here uh, with our, our, our own financial structure, we never have just one person ever handling money. I never handle any money. I don't know what people give. Uh, when people, when offerings are taken up, I don't receive it and have my hands on it. We don't want our pastors to do that. We just, we don't want to give any, uh, you know, opportunity for someone to say, you had your hands on money and maybe you took some of it, you know, and, and we're robbing the, the church. So Paul goes out of his way to do that. Now, this is, I, I say this is important for all of us because I, I know some of you just in, in other uh, avenues of life will be entrusted to handle money. Some of you take up, you know, funds for organizations or clubs or things you're with or at school. This is a great reminder that says, be above board. Have other people there who can be witnesses to say how much money was received and how much was turned over. So no one could come and bring an accusation that would say somehow, hey, you had money and then somehow the, the, the figures didn't add up. Paul went out of his way to do that. So it's a good lesson for him, a good lesson for all of us in leadership, a good lesson for all of us as Christians. Then another thing, Paul says, you, I model for you a clear sense of love and commitment to the people that I was serving. You know, so much about discipleship, again, isn't just uh, passing on information, and it, it, it really is investing in the lives of people. You know, in, in ministry circles, in pastoral circles, sometimes we talk about uh, how we know we're being, uh, you know, effective and there's a, a saying that's used, which it's, you know, we don't like, we don't use this as a positive way. It's just a saying that comes up. People say, oh, the way you know you're effective has to do with nickels and noses. It has to do with how much money people are giving and how many people are showing up. It all has to do with, you know, numbers and accounts and, you know, and, and that's the way we judge success. We don't want to go down that road at all. Paul says one of the, the priorities was you saw how we invested our very lives in you, how much we loved you. One of the marks of true discipleship and one of the things that we want to have as Christians is we invest in the lives of people. We genuinely, genuinely love people. Paul was able to say, look, you know, we, we cared for you like a, a, a loving mother, nurturing there, just, you know, just like a mom would care for her children. He says, that's how we were among you. We, we were understanding, you know, when they came in with their, their questions, with their boo-boos, with, with the things of just like, we're just children. We loved you. We nurtured you. Then he could come along and say, but we were like a dad. We were, we were there encouraging you and instructing you and, you know, and trying to help you to take some steps of, of faith. So he says, all of those things were going on. And the reason we did it was we loved you. You know, all through scripture, just, you know, Jesus reminds us in his teaching, Paul reminds us in, in his teaching, uh, if we don't have love for people, if they don't see us loving people, it's all for nothing. Jesus said, the greatest commandment, love God, love your neighbor. Paul said, if you have gifts to do all these things that, you know, you have uh, gifts to be able to understand scripture and, and do great things, but if you don't have love, you're just a noisy gong. So here again, he says, one of the things that we modeled among you was love for people, genuine love for people. And Paul loved them so much that when they, they had to leave, he was grieved because he had to leave. So that's another thing he models. And then the last one, I realize I've been talking for a while here, but he says, we modeled a clear sense of the goal we had as we worked here. And he says, and the goal was not to be approved by men, but, but to get our approval from God. So God would say, well done, 
good and faithful servants. We weren't trying to do something just to bolster up our reputation. What was important to us was the reputation of the gospel. The gospel of Jesus is true. The gospel of Jesus can be trusted. And so through the whole teaching of this first section of First Thessalonians chapter 2 is this. Paul says, now with all these reminders, here's how it all comes together. This is the ultimate application. Now you go and imitate this so you would live a holy life, pleasing to God, worthy in every respect. So that's, that's kind of the, the thrust of today's teaching. What I want you to do with it is now, wherever you are in your Christian journey, and even if you're ver- first starting off as a Christian, is to say, okay, God, how, how do, am I living my life? Am, am I living my life in a way that would honor you, in a way that would honor the gospel, in a way that people could say, if I follow your example, I know I'm following God. And if there's some things that God says you need to give attention to, well, now's the time to give attention to. Now, I want the final segment I'll close is this, because there's all this family imagery that's in here. We realize, and Paul realized it in his day, and we realize it in our day too. Some people would say, you know, my, my family, you know, uh, my natural family, um, those are the people that I feel maybe the, the most estranged from. As you, as you became a Christian, they may even say, I don't want anything to do with you now. And so one of the things we also see is that even when we gather like this online, for some people we'd say, my church family, that really has become like a, a true family for me. And I, I, I mention this because I want to extend that as an invitation to you. If you're saying, you know, I feel kind of isolated. I don't have strength of family support of others who are Christians in my family to encourage me along and to help me along. I just want to invite you to be a part, not only of the, the family of God, you know, globally, but the family of God here at Friend Free Methodist Church. And if there's any way we can support and encourage you and, and to help you along, we want to do that. Now, part of the way that, that you can help us is by letting us know via this digital connection card that we put up here. So the link's over on the right side of your screen. You can let us know, hey, here's the help I need. Here's a prayer request I have. Anything that we can do to help you along, questions you have about the faith, we wanna be there for you. So we're gonna rely on you to share that with us. We'll do our part to get back with you. So friends, that's our, our message for today. And this is our time for worship today. I just wanna thank you so much for being here. I hope you've been encouraged as we've come together and and being able to sing some songs of praise, to to hear from Sherry, from Pastor Laura, from Pastor Bryce, and then from this time of sharing in the scriptures together. So I'm gonna close our time with prayer and then we'll be done. And I look forward to meeting with you again next week. So let's pray together. Jesus, thank you for this time that you've drawn us together to instruct us from your word. Help us to take something from how you inspired your servant Paul to write this letter to the church at Thessalonica Now, Lord, help us to take something from your living word that would apply to our life as we try to live as faithful disciples today. We thank you for this opportunity to meet online. We thank you for giving us the scriptures to instruct us. We thank you for giving the Holy Spirit to help us. We thank you for giving us a church family that can be there for us. Lord, we thank you for being a way maker that can help us now to navigate through life no matter what it holds. Thanks, Jesus, for this time. Bless us as we go. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So God bless you, folks. We'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.